I'm privileged to have a very special guest in studio and we're going to be talking about the need to strengthen the linkages between research policies and practice really. This is about science. We've had this talk before and uh, research uh, done, paperwork done, but you know putting that into practice seems to be something that's very, very elusive, especially in Africa. And I'll be talking to Dr. Nicholas Ozor. Dr. Nicholas, a very warm welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> you are a scientist as well. Yeah, I'm a scientist and I'm a policy analyst too. A policy analyst. Yes. Where do you hail from? Pardon? Where do you hail from? Okay, I am from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the country, what currently are you working with and uh, I mean, wh which institution are you coming from? Uh, I work with the African Technology Policy Studies Network. Um, it is a multidisciplinary network of researchers, policy makers, and civil society and private sector actors that um, promote the generation, the dissemination, mastery and use of uh, science, technology and innovation for African development. That's very exciting. When, yeah. I mean, talking about science, innovation, all these things, technology, research, it, it must take quite a lot of time to get into this. How, how long have you been doing this? How many years? Well, personally, I've been into research, can I say, since I was born. Wow. Um, <laughs> but uh, specifically on science, technology, and innovation, I joined uh, the services of the University of Nigeria, uh, uh, where I conduct research and teaching and community service. Mm -hmm. So for the past 15 years now, I've been doing research, especially in areas of science, technology, and innovation. Okay, I, I know a few scientists in the country, and every time I have a chat with them, there's always this feeling that whatever it is they say, then no one listens to them. And so to speak, scientists in this country, I'm not too sure about the, the, the larger Africa, you'll, you, you'll tell us, they're not really appreciated for the work they do. Is, is that true? Yeah, I can tell you that uh, scientists in this part of the world are not really appreciated. They are not celebrated the, the way they should. Because uh, take for instance, they, they do a lot of research that come out with great outcomes but you find those research outcomes stacked at the library. So most of them are not put into use. And because of that, um, even the, the policy makers who should derive evidence from those research that, uh, researches that uh, people conduct in universities and research institutions, they do, they do not do, most times they do not do that. So you find the researchers you know, existing in silos in the universities, they are not talking with the policymakers, they're not making the required impact that should inform government decisions and also that should be translated into practice, which the private sector should use and, uh, you know, do their businesses. So they are not celebrated, they are not well appreciated, and that is why we are making this call that there is a need to strengthen the relationship, the linkages between research, policy, and practice. And I speak to you, that is what has informed the um, uh, decision of the African Technology Policy Studies Network, my organization, mm -hmm. to organize uh, a, an international workshop and conference, which will be holding in Mombasa from 7 to 10 uh, November this year at the Sarova Hotel, to bring these relevant stakeholders together, the policymakers, the researchers, the private sector actors, the civil society, all of them, we sit down and chat the proactive way forward on how we can begin to talk to each other mm -hmm. and understand each other. Currently, the, the way researchers communicate to policymakers, I mean, they don't know how to communicate to them. Uh, as, as at the moment, or they don't have the requisite skills to reach the policymakers. So also, the policymakers themselves, they complain about uh, the way that the, the lecturers are, uh, not lecturers, researchers generally, are not communicating in the language they understand. So there is strongly, i give you an example. Sometime last year, uh, during the African Ministerial Conference in, uh, in Kampala, 
uh, Uganda, where I happen to have trained ministers of agriculture and education and uh, vice chancellors. Uh, I, I had to give, I give, I give the vice chancellors and some of the researchers there some, some um, task to, 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 to communicate. How best can they communicate to the ministers? As you mean, when we go for lunch, you have your minister there. You remember when you get back to your country, you may not have, you may not have uh, the opportunity to get to your minister again. So I told them, if you are asked to sell one proposal to your minister, who is sitting next to you here, how can you do that effectively within five minutes? They, they cannot do that. I mean, the way to approach them, the language, even the proposal itself, they, they don't have that skill. And it's not their, their fault because the, the, the generic training most researchers have do not have this scale of communication to the higher group like the policymakers. So this is what we need to change. There needs to be a mindset change mm -hmm. both from the researchers and also from the policymakers. There needs to be a kind of transdisciplinarity in the kind of research they do, a production of you know, knowledge with the society in such a way that all the, all the actors that are required in any research exercise or research process come together to say, this research effort is of national pri priority, which means the, 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 the policymakers will key into it, the researchers will key into it, the civil society will key into it, the private sector we came to it. It is only then that research, research and researches we mean uh, we have the impact, required impact. So as I was telling you, these researchers they found it they find it difficult to communicate to, communicate. to the policymakers. I mean, we, we do countless of stories about res research being done in Europe and uh, other parts of the world, but not Africa. Can you say it's an African phenomenon? We don't trust in our own, or rather we don't groom or even grow our own in the sense of you know, listening to what they've come up with and saying, hey, there's something here. Let's, let's talk about this or let's think about this. But we more or less trust something that comes from outside Africa. Is that an, a phenomenon that uh, it's a factor here? Yeah, that's, you, are, you are just right. Um, I said it earlier. I said there is there is a gap mm -hmm. and we need a mindset change currently the way we think is uh, so so narrow we need to bring in other issues i mean open our minds uh, we need to uh, be transdisciplinary we need to um, trust each other because currently that trust you raised is a very serious uh, problem that that hinders this linkage. In the advanced society, you find out that even when a research problem is being formulated, they, they formulate a research problem based on existing problem in the society. And when such a research problem is um, formulated, you find the private sectors who have the money to invest coming in to say, I'll be interested in this research. I can put in my money to ensure that the research outputs are generated. Mm -hmm. And in the course of that linkage, where the private sector voluntarily come in to uh, talk with the researcher to say, let's conduct this research because I am interested in the uh, output that could come out of it. And remember, it is of national interest because the government would have identified such problem as an existing problem. So they also have interest and the enabling environment is there. So when such a research effort is conducted, you find out that if it leads to an innovation that could be commercialized, the private sector person will be ready to invest his money into it and then take it along. That is why you have um, jobs created. That is why you have industries and uh, people are happier in that, in that part of the world. But here, uh, the reverse is the case. Most researches that are done over here uh, do not um, conform with the national priorities of the government. And that is why the government complained that the, research, the researchers are not uh, 
Uh, I mean, they don't, they don't uh, talk to them the way they understand. So most of the researches that are conducted are not of uh, national priority and do not conform with the national agenda. Most researchers just do research for research's sake, just to publish and get their promotions. They do not care whether such outcomes from the research are put into use, mm -hmm. which means they do not involve the private sectors who could invest in the outcome of those research outputs. What other challenges do scientists or researchers in Africa go through? Um, there are a lot of challenges, actually. Uh, but even though we don't want to talk about challenges, mm -hmm. we want to know what, what are the steps forward, what do we do. But talking about challenges, one, you find out that, that um, uh, there's lack of funds. Researchers or researchers do not have enough money. In the university, for instance, you find lecturers struggling with you know, their salary, mega, mega salaries to conduct personal research, to be able to publish, because if you don't publish, you perish, of course. Mm -hmm. So if there is a research endowment and incentives given to researchers to conduct research, you find out that uh, uh, there will be more output and impact. And those researches that are conducted, if it is tailored towards national priorities so that it will be able to make impact to the desired um, line of action of the government, that is the best thing we would want. Also, the, the skill, the skill to conduct policy research, most researchers do not have that. And they need to not only conduct effective research, but also communicate the outcome of that research so that the policymakers who will use it to take decisions will use it. If you are not able to write, maybe you do a research of, uh, that will come up to 500 pages, a policymaker will not have the time to read your thesis. Mm -hmm. A policymaker will only be interested in a two page. A document to say this is what I have done, look at the recommendations, look at how to do it. So that is what the policymaker wants. So how can you, also in that, in that training, I asked the researchers, the vice chancellors, to produce a policy brief. They could not do a, an effective policy brief. And the ministers complained. They said, you, you see why, why we don't understand them? Look at this policy brief. It's not communicating. It's just a wish list. They have not told us what the problem is, how to combat it, you know, under a particular, um, um, I mean, using a particular framework. Mm -hmm. So because policymakers, they don't have time. Most of them are, are struggling with uh, uh, tenure, tenure issue, you know. Most of them are even in, like, in some parts of, the, of Africa, I find... Some people are not elected uh, duly. They are in the court protesting their elections. Mm -hmm. And then you are talking to him about uh, research. He may not have time <laughs> he, because you he, will be more interested in how he wins his next election. So because of that, most policymakers are interested in low-hanging fruits. They just want a quick, um, tangible thing to do to their cons in their constituency so that people will say they are working. They find it difficult to invest in long-term efforts like research, which is more sustainable. So the problem is the researchers themselves, they do not know how to communicate effectively to the policymakers. So we are now advocating. Let us all sit down in a round table and chat the best way forward on how we can communicate with each other, understand what our plights are, speak in the language we will all understand, I mean, vice versa, the language the researchers will understand, establish research endowments in research institutions. During the time uh, of the GMO in Kenya, this should have been, this should be an evidence-based discussion. They would have co contacted all the research institutions to carry out research to say, GMO is good, GMO is bad. Or GMO is the best option for us now because of the situation we are in. But let the decisions be based on evidence, 
not political. Mm -hmm. So it is only then that our researchers will feel that they are important. If policymakers begin to take decisions based on the research outcomes from our research institutions, that is the only time they can be appreciated. But when policymakers are more interested with tenure elongations and uh, not the plight of the people and not using evidence-based research to make informed policy decisions, then we we'll continue to have problems. I mean, I mean Dr. Nicholas, also, the, 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 then with what you're saying, communication really seems to be the biggest impediment in actually having some of the solutions like you're talking about, how to practically handle the research that has been done by researchers or scientists. But the, uh, we'll get into the details of how we can strengthen these linkages. But the other question would be, there's a conspiracy theory perhaps, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you today, as Dr. Nicholas, come up with a research findings and recommendations on uh, how to cure a particular disease, let's say HIV AIDS, yep. and because you're an African, you've come up with that, you say this is the solution, this is the cure. There is this theory that perhaps the Western countries will try and fight you through the government and through the policymakers and actually stop you from you know, having uh, your recommendations taken seriously. Is that true for most of African scientists to come up with solutions, but, you know, money <coughs> exchanges hands and, you know, they're stopped? Um, what I will say here is it boils down to what we call, if we are really independent, uh, we should, uh, we should uh, promote self-rule. And uh, when I was in the university system, one of the one of the um, one of the ways to know that you are a good academic is if you have published in um, some international journals like Nature and all those. And then you find out that if you have published in those international journals, most of the um, journals are not accessible to local researchers mm -hmm. and local policymakers and local private sectors to even put into use. So the issue is, how do we promote the internal research efforts of our people? I do not believe that if I am a researcher and I come up with um, a solution to a problem, that uh, uh, it, it, will not be, it will not be acceptable. The government should be able to appreciate and celebrate the outputs and the outcomes and the products 